it's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them before. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. Around. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be Wellbeing Partner at this year's Festival of Education and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session, part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing, and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education.
We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Dickens, the editor of Schools Week, and this afternoon I'll be interviewing Ofsted's Chief Inspector, Amanda Spielman, following a keynote address to the festival. Um, Amanda has been Ofsted Chief Inspector since January 2017, and early this month, Parliament confirmed that her tenure would be extended for two years. She's been a regular attendee and speaker at the Festival of Education and first addressed the, festi the festival as Chief Inspector in June 2017. In normal times, Amanda would be packing out the main stage. Uh, today, she will be speaking, from, speaking to us from her lovely Ofsted office. Uh, Festival, please welcome the Chief Inspector, Amanda Spielman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is great to be speaking at the festival again, even if it is in a, a rather different format this year. And I really do hope that this is the first and last time we do it online. And not just because I'm missing the sunshine and the lovely setting that we've been so spoiled by in recent years. As John said, I, I did sp speak first at this festival as chief inspector um, at the 2017 festival. I think I've spoken at everyone since and I've spoken several times um, in my off call capacity before that. So, so I really value and welcome the full forum it gives. But when I spoke in 2017, I'd only recently started in this job and it was this speech at Wellington that really gave me the chance to set out my stall. So I've only got about 15 minutes, I think, to talk to you today before what I hope is going to be a gentle grilling by John. So I thought I'd start by looking back at what I said then. And the centerpiece of my 2017 speech was the substance of education, the curriculum. It marked the start of a period of reform at Ofsted and we spent the following two years working towards a new inspection framework, which we began in 2019. And of course, as you know, this framework puts a clear focus on the curriculum. It was developed with a lot of input from the teaching profession. And I think it's fair to say that it's been generally well received. We know from the feedback we've had from inspections and from many other conversations that the profession has welcomed the chance to think about the curriculum afresh. And you also welcomed the move away from data-focused inspection to a framework that puts less emphasis on exam performance alone. Now, I would never argue against the life-changing impact of good exam results. And of course, all schools and colleges should aim to make the most of every student's potential. But grades aren't education in themselves. They should be a mirror of a good education. And it's the education that we want to look at. I was also determined that inspection shouldn't be predicated on a narrowly utilitarian view of education. We do do children a great disservice if we see them only as economic units, with education as the path to work readiness, important as that is. Back in 2017, I said that education should be about broadening minds, enriching communities and advancing civilization, about leaving the world a better place than we found it. That's what I believed then, and it's what I believe today. It's a formulation that encompasses preparing children for adult life and work without limiting them. That core statement about the several purposes of education has been a useful anchor for me. And we all know anchors are most valuable in choppy waters. In a few weeks time, schools and colleges will close their gates for the summer ending the most wretched year and a half for education in living memory. School and college staff will be regrouping over the summer and preparing for a challenging year ahead. So much has been said about catch up or education recovery to use the language that seems to sit more comfortably with the sector. Plans were hatched and then scaled back. New ideas are still being floated ahead of the next spending review. But as I've consistently said, for most children, most catching up will happen in their usual classroom with their usual teachers. The magic of teaching, imparting knowledge, developing skills, building confidence, 
will mostly happen where it always happens. And we shouldn't let pressure to fill learning gaps bend what schools and colleges do out of shape. Broadening minds, enriching communities, advancing civilization is still exactly what's needed from our schools. So when I'm asked how we will inspect in September, I keep those purposes in mind. There are technical answers about methodology and appropriate answers about meeting schools where they are. But there's also the central truth. We still believe in the substance of education and that's what we want to see in action. So the education inspection framework, the EIF focused on the curriculum is here to stay. And of course, there are always those who follow the adage, never waste a good crisis. There's been no shortage of ideas from the, the clean slaters and flag flyers of the education world. The pandemic has opened up discussion about the role of schools in promoting pupil well-being, about how catch up should be measured, and sometimes about wholesale reinvention of education. For reformers and would-be reformers, Ofsted is the carrot or the stick, depending on your point of view, that can drive changes in schools. Should we put more weight on well-being and inspect through that lens? Should we judge schools on how well they address disadvantage and seek to effect social change through the inspection process? Should the pressing issue of the day be made a limiting judgment so that schools have no choice but to give it top priority? I do try hard to avoid reshaping inspection to address each issue as it comes along. The inspection process is already vigorous and robust. Safeguarding is a non-negotiable. Personal development is a clear area of focus. Behaviour is given the prominence it deserves, and leadership and management is of critical importance. In fact, when it comes to the debate about how Ofsted assesses schools that operate in areas of significant disadvantage, I'm always at pains to stress the importance of the leadership and management judgment. Where a school struggles with issues that are out of its control, recruitment challenges, for instance, it's the leadership and management judgment that marks a school out as having real capacity to improve. Leadership that has the right ideas, demonstrates the right approach and has the courage of its convictions will always be recognized. So I want to maintain our course, prioritizing the substance of education. This approach has real value in many areas needing particular attention at the moment, like teacher education and development, which are going to be absolutely critical as the sector meets the challenges of this recovery period, or the education of children with SEND, or of children in alternative provision. I do firmly believe that the EIF has the flexibility to adjust to current circumstances. And that's because of its focus on education substance and on the journey, not just the end results. It makes it easier to allow for the struggles that children are having after missing so much. And it also encourages proper thinking about how to reshape the curriculum rather than just rushing through at breakneck speed to cover everything that's been missed, but at a superficial level. I hope too that stability in the EIF gives schools and teachers more certainty at a time when so much has changed. Schools adapted with speed and resourcefulness to the pandemic, to remote education, of course, but also to offering wider community support where it's been needed. It's understandable that some people think it's time to look harder at the part schools play in pupils' health and happiness. My view is that for most children, a good school contributes much to their well-being. Good education in orderly classrooms, developing wider interests through sport, music, and other extracurricular activities, building friendships, good pastoral care with that watchful teacher eye for problems. Well-being isn't an activity, it's an outcome. It's so important that schools return to what they do best and don't get knocked off course by the pressure for them to solve every social ill. And I'm very aware of the irony of my saying this right now. We've just published our review of sexual harassment and violence in schools and colleges. And that highlighted once again, the role of schools in setting a culture that will stretch far beyond their gates. But I hope our review also made it abundantly clear that schools and colleges are part of a bigger picture. Schools must be places where abuse and harassment are not tolerated but the social shift 
needed to address a problem as widespread and ingrained as this one cannot be left to schools alone. So when I talk about schools being knocked off course and being under pressure to resolve social matters, societal matters, it's often not a clear cut issue. Although when the matter relates directly to pupil safety, the relevance of, of and role of schools is clearer. But there is a newer phenomenon that I think is problematic for schools, and that is activism, or rather a particularly confrontational brand of activism. Because of course, activism has a long and noble history. Activists have shaped society and play a major role in changing the world for the better, most obviously in promoting civil rights and pushing for the kinds of legislation that dramatically improves the lives of whole sections of society. I've just mentioned our sexual abuse review, commissioned by the government in response to the outpouring of personal testimonies on the Everyone's Invited website. That was activism in action, and nobody can argue about its merits. What I'm concerned about is not the activism that broadens debate and brings about long-term change, but the militant kind of activism that demands immediate adherence to a position. We are seeing these confrontational approaches both outside and inside schools. It's affecting staff, parents and children and can have a limiting effect on education. And this matters because education does lie at the heart of social change. Education builds understanding and acceptance. The reason Section 28 remains powerfully symbolic is that it was perceived as an attempt to remove discussion of homosexuality from the classroom. It looked like an attempt to enforce a moral orthodoxy on education through legislation, and it failed. The Equality Act is in a way the polar opposite of Section 28. Rather than restrict discussion, the Act tells schools what they must teach. On the face of it, this should ensure that children grow up with a diverse and rounded understanding of society. But moral orthodoxies haven't gone away. The protected characteristics enshrined in the Equality Act don't always exist in harmony, and the conflict between them cannot be entirely neutered by legislation. Which brings us back to schools. It cannot be right for children to have to cross what amount to picket lines outside their school because one group's religious beliefs, protected by law, sit uncomfortably with teaching about another group's sexuality, also protected by law. It cannot be right that the curriculum can be filleted by pressure groups. And the militant defense of orthodoxies isn't confined to adult protests or to the protected characteristics. We're also seeing more pupil activism in, in schools on many fronts. Some of this is about racism or anti-racism, some is about climate change. Some is about issues that are quite remote for most British children, such as the charged and complicated politics of the Middle East. But in some cases, children and teachers are suffering abuse or even violence simply for being who they are, for being the wrong religion or race or ethnicity. This is completely unacceptable. And nor should children be all but forced to support a fellow student's campaign no matter how compellingly presented, nor feel that they will be ostracized if they do not. This is a difficult problem for schools. So much effort goes into encouraging young people to understand and think about their democratic rights, which of course include the right to protest and to campaign for what they believe in. But education must come first and no child should ever feel targeted or marginalized because intolerance has replaced reasoned debate. Schools must continue to be places for all children to be welcomed, to learn and to grow in every sense. However high feelings run on an issue, the correct response of a school should surely be educational. For some issues, the right approach may be to help children learn about the historical background so they can understand the tensions at play today. Let's expose young people to alternative perspectives on complex problems. Let's give them the tools to make their own political choices, including decisions about the rights and wrongs of world events. Let's not have teachers policed by self-appointed moral guardians who refuse to tolerate an alternative viewpoint or harried on social media into apologizing for what they've said or into changing the way they teach 
in the face of militant activism. Social media can enable great humanity when it rallies around charity or disaster. And it's a mechanism through which ideas can be shared and debated. But sadly, it can also be a place of groupthink, intolerance and bullying. It fosters and then feeds off tribalism, whether in politics or in social attitudes. It encourages people to run with their herd, feeling at home in the company of like-minded types. Education should never fall into the same trap. Campaigners often aim to convince us that in a complex world full of difficult challenges and multifaceted problems, there are simple solutions. But to educate our children properly, we shouldn't pretend that this is true. To return to where I started, that's why substance matters. It's why teaching a rich and stimulating curriculum matters. And it's why broadening minds remains our best hope of leaving the world a better place than we found it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Shall we move on to some questions now? Please. Um, the, I, I should also say that we should be able to squeeze in some questions from the audience at, at the end, so please do submit them via Slido. Um, I wanted to start first of all, Amanda, congratulations on your two-year extension. Um, how, how did the extension come about? Was it something that, did you ask the DfE? Did they approach you? I was asked, um, I think, at late last year through civil service channels, um, if I would be willing to, to consider um, serving a further term, and I indicated that I would. I imagine it was something that you, um, you, you favoured and, and, and wanted to happen before the approach. Um, I am very pleased to be reappointed. Re I very much enjoy this job. Um, I've lost. I feel as though I've lost um, a chunk of the term I in, originally signed up for um, because of COVID. Obviously, routine inspections been suspended for a while, and like everybody else, we've been diverted into a great deal of COVID response work over over the last year. Um, I think we've we've done that as well as we can. We've been able um, through the, through the autumn and spring also. Um, to, to come back round into the sectors we inspect and regulate in a way that I hope has been constructive and supportive and to, to really help move things forward. Um, but I would very much like to be to be full steam ahead and I very much hope that we will be from September. So there's lot, lots, I think, for us to do. What are your priorities for the, for the two years? Well, first, um, clearly, um, re-establishing um, the EIF um, flow the we, we had we had to suspend routine inspection when the new framework had been in place um, for just six months and the early feedback was generally very encouraging we dined out a couple of wrinkles um, I really want to see that to see that well embedded um, there are um, obviously um, the outstanding exemption was removed um, what, um, while inspection has been suspended so so outstanding schools will be coming back into mainstream inspection that's going to give us a wider range of insights and perspective um, that will help us feed insights back to the whole sector and I hope um, help with the, the sort of post-COVID um, iterations of education. Um, there's a good deal of development on the, the teacher training and professional development front. Um, we're inspecting initial teacher education with a new framework and we're also um, going to be working on the early career framework and NPQs. Um, so it's rounding out into a sort of bigger and more exciting conception um, of teacher education and development, I think, um, that I'm very much looking forward to contributing to. And of course, the work we do in early years and social care um, continue, continues to develop, um, perhaps attracts a bit less of the media attention. It's really important. And last but not least, um, I know Shane will be particularly pleased with me for, um, for, 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 for mentioning the, the very exciting sort of evolution of the skills landscape. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great many parts there. We're do, we're do, we're do, we've done a lot of work and uh, bringing together a great many more pieces. I, I hope to feed into, into that evolution. I just want to, uh, since you mentioned the, the, the skills area, I, I just want to touch upon something that, that you mentioned in your speech. Um, on several occasions in, in past speeches and annual reports, you've, you've criticised the, the FE college sector for, for chasing funding by running courses such as in arts rather than focusing on matching courses to, to local job opportunities. 
Um, yeah, in your speech today, you said we do children a great disservice if we see them only as economic units with education as the path to work readiness. Uh, you, you also said education should be about broadening minds, enriching communities and advancing civilization. Do, do you think that message is, is a little bit confusing? And which is it? Is it education for economic benefit or is it about broadening minds? It's both. Um, you could you you can you can you can you can go 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 to go too far in both directions in sort of pure academic um, pers 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 pursuits um, without any any mind to to where young people need, need need to end up to have good jobs good good jobs stable sta stable careers interesting lives um, and. Um, so, 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 you, so you've got. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Start, start that answer again. You have. You have to balance the two. On the one hand, you do have to develop. You have to develop young people's minds for them to find the best path um, to that stable job, the interesting career, and 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 the and the, and the, the worthwhile life. So, so what matters is making sure that the paths you steer young people down are properly suited um, to their skills, that 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 their, their abilities. But also, don't risk trapping them in a dead end where they where they suddenly find they've spent several years studying thing, and it's really hard for them to get from that to some to to to, to something that will get them into the kind of employment that that everybody um, wants all young people to find their way into. So the message for colleges is focus on a bit of both, prioritize one or the other. Yeah, we've we, we've 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 seen places in inspection um, in the school and college sector. Where it's clear that that balance has 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 tilted a bit too far towards um, collecting funding or stacking up performance table table points, and the the interests of the young people underneath have got slightly lost. And they may it, it may have been easy to say this is an interesting thing to do, but it's been so far um, from something that's likely to take them a stage onwards that that it's it's not been very good advice to them to say yes, do that, and every everything will be fine. Um, it's about it's 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 about making sure that that, that that young people are well advised, and do the kind of education program at every stage that both um, keeps the broadest set of opportunities, but creates a sort of coherent path towards a plausible future for them. If we move to um, talking about the return of full inspections in schools that's, that's yeah. slated for, for September. Um, is this set in stone or is it something that could be derailed again? Um, and when do we expect that schools will get confirmation that it is going ahead? Have you got a way of making coronavirus tell you what it's going to do, John? Um, no, so, no. Please, please let us in, in, into your crystal ball. Um, at the moment, as far as I know, um, everything I know says, says that the expectation is that we, we will return to a normal full inspection um, pro program in, in September. Um, I think everybody hopes that restrictions will have been lifted and we'll be getting back to normal. And for me, um, inspection is, is actually what parents inspect and what children deserve because children have only have one shot at education. It's been hugely disrupted over the last two years. We've all got to play our part now to make sure that for children who've lost a chunk of their years in school, um, to, co to, to COVID, that the, the rest of what they get is as good as it can possibly be. And um, what, what do you envisage the, the biggest challenges will be for, for, for Ofsted when, when full inspections are being Well, we've, we've piloted um, the, the, the model to make, to, to make sure that the framework works. We've, 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 made some, we've, we've published some new transition statements in the handbook. Um, we've tested how we talk, how how we take have have the conversations about the nature of the disruption and how schools have responded and how they're plan, planning forward. Um, as always, the policing process has ironed out a couple of wrinkles, but we think we've got something um, that's flexible and responsive. I think it's I think it's actually very fortunate that pre-COVID and I claim no crystal ball here myself, um, but that we just shifted to a model that was much much less dependent on on public outcomes um, it would be a little tricky if we had an inspection model where, where kind of one of the key judgments was, was was very outcome driven at this point given the the absence of of published outcomes for either 20 or 21 and that data is not being passed to us under the table um, so so i think we've got as I, as I as i said in the speech i think we've got something something strong that looks at the journey um, and progress on that journey as, as, as well 
as at the outcomes in terms of the, the, the curriculum that the school, the school has set up, right? school or college or, 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 or nursery, sorry, I, I must remember um, to express the full range. Um, so I, I ge genu genuinely think this, this is a, power, a powerful tool that is, that is flexible and will help um, schools and colleges that are at very different stages on that journey. And you mentioned there, the, you mentioned there the, the trial that you run. Um, I, I think it was earlier this year. What were, the, what were the key findings from that in terms of what you think needs to change um, when inspections do return? John, you're asking me to, to cast my mind back. I'm afraid I haven't got the top of my head what those tweaks were. It's the kind of thing which um, I know my policy colleagues will, could, could, could be very, very helpful helpful with um if you if you want to go to them but i'm i think the form of the transition statement um was was one of the things that that, that was shaped up i i'm afraid i honestly can't answer that okay no worries no worries. and so, something that schools week has written up uh, written about before is um uh, gradings for schools in disadvantaged areas um I, I think you mentioned yourself that the, the overall judgments are on average lower for the most disadvantaged schools. And your view, you know, surmising very roughly is that actually this, this is okay because those schools are more likely to have offset rate their leadership and management more highly than their overall effectiveness. And um, many schools don't agree with that. And, and they actually think it's, it, you know, it's, it's really unfair that schools in poor areas get lower grades. So, so what do you say to that? Do you accept it is unfair? No, I'm, I'm afraid I don't accept it's unfair because because the partly because the premise buried in that is that is that schools are equally good everywhere, no matter what the so despite despite the circumstances in which they operate, and even though we know that there are much bigger challenges in some areas than others, and um, the 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 important point I think is is to is to understand that distinction between our leaders and managers doing. The best they can and doing a sort of responsible and th thorough job in difficult circumstances and is what's coming out at the other end as good as it can be for children so we have to report to parents on the overall effectiveness of the school for the, for, for, the, for their for their children um, to help parents understand the quality of education that, that they're, they're getting and we have to to be consistent we can't tell it can't tell a parent well your school's pretty good considering the town it's in, um, but we'd expect would be would be expecting more for that judgment if 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 the school was it was in was in London or Bournemouth, but but because it's in because it's in Sunderland, you have to accept a lower standard. Um, so it's it's not a perfect parallel, but it's a little bit like the distinction between an effort grade and an, and an attainment grade. The leadership and management grade judgment is doing something slightly different it is really important and that is the best assessment of the quality of the quality of a team but, but i really really um find my find myself incredibly uncomfortable about the about the idea of saying if the school was in a posher neighborhood it wouldn't be good enough but it's good enough for these children so we so we have to keep that objectivity but we also have to make sure that the that the way, the way we report makes clear when the circumstances that are likely to be leading um, to a lower than expected judgment are not things that are, are within within the control of the of the leadership team. So, for example, we know that in many coastal towns it's hard to recruit teachers. It would be very hard for us to say um, that. That the, the cur curriculum was was really good in a school that had, let's say, no or, or almost no qualified maths teachers and was relying on people stretching over um, from out from other specialisms, um, but that might be something that was entirely out of a school's school's control. So m understanding that that distinction between leadership and management, which is essentially judging what's it within school's control, and the pupil experience, which is determined by a mix of things in and out of schools control is, is, is the way to think about it. And to recognize that those are two conceptually distinct things that you can't simply neatly um, roll into one thing. So my answer here is always unpack and think separately about those key judgments. 
There was, um, I think it was the third phase of your curriculum research that found schools in the most deprived communities outscored their more affluent counterparts on the quality of curriculum. Um, I, I think when we reported at the time that the findings suggested that the new inspection framework could yeah. turn the tables on this this, this sort of bias, um, but it, it doesn't it, seem to have happened. Well, it's it's still very early days. We 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 we've only we've only had six months, and remember, in in any short period, the schools that are are inspected because we come back more frequently to the weakest schools. It's not a it's not a what, what's what's come out in the first few months. Um, is was 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 not was not a random sample of schools, and also some of the things that we reported on um, were cases where the curriculum had been um, less less than good because choices had been made which did limit children's opportunities. We we reported on, for example, on some schools where 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 there was a very strong push. Um, on young people to take BTEX by default in the open bucket in, pro in progress eight, irrespective of what the right the right choice for them was. Um, so, so some of those are things which, with the with the issues of better exposed and understood, we may we may well find things looking different as 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 we as we come back come back from September. Different choices may be being made. Um, I genuinely think that the EIF approach does give more school more, more scope for schools that. Don't necessarily have the the best results to achieve the highest grades based on the quality of education they're providing. How, how do you think you'll get through the the backlog of schools that, that need inspecting? When well, we're, we're discussing with the, the with the Department of of, of edu Education so precisely um, um, how this will work. But clearly, um, we're not we we don't we don't we don't have the capacity simply to 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 do. 18 months worth of inspections next 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 term so 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 there, there will be a, a phased a phased approach and um, i just want to touch on quickly the the sex abuse review stuff uh, i mean i don't want to go over too much old ground because there's been a lot written about it and um, i just want to touch on one aspect um does this new focus on safeguarding make the current framework inadequate? Can Ofsted be a safeguarding watchdog and also deliver judgments on the, the quality of education and, and do both effectively? Safeguarding has been a big piece of our inspection framework for a very long time. Um, I think sometimes people who write about us assume that assume that we are overwhelmingly academic, but our inspectors have the full range of it of, of, of experience and expertise. Many of them have more of a background on the as much or as, as much of a background on the safeguarding side. Have had those kinds of roles as as, as school as school leaders, um, and of course we've got the so the social care side of Ofsted also has enormous safeguarding expertise, and we very much bring the pieces together. In the work we do, what the abuse review has shown, I think, is that this is an area of safeguarding where it is particularly hard for schools to surface the problems. And um, we really unpacked in the review the, the the many reasons why young people are so reluctant to talk to adults, whether in school or at home, um, about ab about these issues. So the mechanism that we built into EIF asking schools to, 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 to tell us about incidences of sexual harassment and, and violence hadn't actually brought out very much. So, 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 so we're certainly going to have to, to, to push a bit harder in those safeguarding conversations. Um, and as, as, we, as we recommended, um, to, 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 put, to put some, some extra emphasis in the, the wider culture building and into the relationships and sex and health ed health education piece um, to, to understand better how, how how schools are addressing the issues in that but but the the current framework is is absolutely conceived with a very strong safeguarding strand I guess something that that we we, we sort of got quite strongly from the school sector was you know, did, didn't this whole sexual harassment scandal sort of happen under the no, under the noses of Ofsted? And yeah. you know, you were effectively forced into action. So, 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 who is actually holding Ofsted account for for, no. for their potential failings in any of this? We absolutely weren't forced into action. We started work um, back in the, the the back in 2017 and sort of developed inspector training and started developing this new framework. Um, with, with, with this explicit strand about sex, um, about sexual harassment, we'd already been um, 
look at looking at it hard, hard, harder in inspections. Um, all our we, we, we had series of inspe inspector trainings. Um, as I think this 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 review review has shown, it's something that doesn't readily surface but surface by default what we found in in these review visits is that the specific incidents and sort of si serious cases of sexual assault that, that came to the attention of school schools um what have in general been dealt with as 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 they should be and of course one strand of inspection has very much been looking at this but this is about the wider lives of young people the gray space um, that sits between what parents can over directly oversee and what schools can directly oversee. And much of what happens there sort of bleeds over into young people's school lives without necessarily being, being think specific incidents that are happening in school. So what we're saying is, is that a distinction that used to be much clearer about in school or out of school has become much more blurred and reconceiving um, in a, a realistic but constructive and ambitious way the part that the education system can play in culture setting feels like a really important thing to do at this, this point and that's what our what our recommendations were aimed at so I think I think I think blaming people um, is is not something that is going to help help do anything here it's about how we get the thinking right through the system and the the, the cut the culture setting right through the system that makes it possible to talk about the, these these very difficult and sensitive things. Do you, do you think that anybody needs to maybe take a look at Ofsted's role in this just to see if there's things that you miss, things that you could improve on, or is that something that, that well, you the, so? edu the Education Select Committee um, does a great deal of that. Um, the 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 trade the trade press certainly does a great deal of that. The Department of Education spends a great a great deal of time on that. We, I'm, I can't say we feel short of scrutiny. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I just I just want to roll back now to um, November two thousand and nineteen. In in the run up to the general election, the the Conservative Party made um, a couple of quite bold pledges uh, relating to Ofsted. Uh, they, they said that they would increase inspections for secondary schools and large primaries by one day, um, making them three days long, and also trial no-notice inspections. Um, I, I totally understand that, that, that COVID has, has sort of intervened um, after that announcement, but um, what's going on with it? Has there been discussions? Is it still something that's on the agenda? Have, have, have you had discussions with government about it, or is it something that has just, just been parked while, while COVID has been going well, on? I think your characterization of the of of, of, of the that 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 rather large COVID, COVID um, post COVID basket may, may may be the right right one for that one. Um, I will point out though though I mentioned I did did mention a few minutes ago the outstanding ex the removal of the outstanding exemption um, is the, um, is is the sing the single biggest thing for us um, that we we will we will be picking up from September um, alongside some additional thematic reviews. Um, in relation to to the education recovery funding on the the teacher education and the um, tutoring program. When was the last time you spoke to government about the, the these election pledges? I honestly can't remember, John. That long ago, and and, and if if they do uh, if they do eventually come to be enacted when do you envisage that might be I'm, I'm guessing next year is, is is probably a bit too soon a bit further down the line I think government at the moment is is very much focused on the next spending review um, and uh, as far as I can see every part of government is expecting a sort of gigantic tussle um, and for me children are an overwhelming priority at this point I mean it, it's I've, I've, I've said on previous occasions that that, that ch children have been pretty low on the on, on the public priority list um, in the last in, in the last year year and a bit um, for some good some, for, for some good reasons at very at, at various points. But but there are so many things stacking up 
um, the things we've seen about CAMS, the things we've seen about speech and language, um, and of course, just the, the basic impact of miss, miss, missing so much school for so, for so many. Um, despite the best efforts of schools to provide remote education, it's clear that for a, for, for a, for a lot of children and young people, they weren't in a position to, to, to make very good use of it. We know that a lot of children have missed a great deal of education. So I'm, I am really, really hoping that this spending review recognises how much children have lost um, and, and creates the space um, to, to help get, get every, every young person's life back on track. And I see the work we do as part of that. What do you make of the government's decision to um, not provide the £15 billion pounds um recovery funding that sir kevin collins asked for and then later resigned over it was clearly an inc incredibly um long and complicated and 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 di 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 difficult negotiation i think the piece the pieces that have that have come through in terms of the the tutoring um which very much needs to be an adjunct a good adjunct to the the core teaching that teachers do do in school that because most catch up, as I said, will happen in those normal classrooms with normal teachers. So tutoring has to really build around that to get the children who've, who've come adrift from the range of the normal classroom back into that range as quickly as possible. Um, the teacher education, teacher development, that's an, that's an incredibly important piece. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that, the, the, that those pieces are there. Um, it's it's disappointing that ev everything else is on hold until the spending review com comes round. Okay, and um, one final question from me before we move on to a few from the audience. Um, Ofsted jumped in to help out Ofqual last year amid the grading fiasco. Um, there were murmurs of a, of a sort of mega merger of the, of the two organisations coming together. Was that something that you've ever discussed um, with others? And do you think it's something that would work? There was never the slightest um, intention on anybody's part that I'm aware of. Um, I certainly never discussed it with anybody or contemplated. It was strictly a short term um, helping helping hand um, at a particularly tough time where we had the capacity to give that help. Um, so and I think what we do is fundamentally different. Um, and I would from my point of view, I would I would prefer to keep Ofsted focused on on the things that we do and do well. Excellent. So we, we have we have quite a few questions in um, from our listeners. Uh, the, the first one, given I, I have given you a bit of a gentle grilling, is, is actually quite a nice one. So let's start with that. And um, what are you most proud of in, in your time as uh, the chief inspector? Well, I am immensely proud of this new inspection framework. I think we've built something that people around the system think is stronger, better, fairer, and creates the kind of professional dialogue that genuinely helps people reflect on what they're doing um, and plan and carry, carry forward improvement. Um, it was intended to be constructive, supportive, without losing that sort of clarity of focus that I do th genuinely think we need for children, um, for, 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 for ch for children in children's interests. Um, and I am very, very much want to take that forward and embed it. Another question we have is, um, what is Ofsted's commitment to diversity, given its own board and staff are not diverse at all? Uh, should, should schools be rated good if, if there's no diverse leadership? Um, well, first of all, um, that's that's not a true statement about Ofsted. We have pretty 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 significant diversity among our staff, but um, most people only ever see a very a very small fraction of our staff. Um, but it's something we 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 track very carefully and put a great deal of effort in our recruitment, um, in our in 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 our in our management. Um, we 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 do as much work and 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 more as 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 most organisations. We couldn't take it more seriously. Um, Sorry, but the, the 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 second the second part of it is should should schools be judged judged good? This this comes back to to the 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 point again. The point I made in my speech is that every every 
um, hot topic, one of the first things that happens is people say we should make that a limiting judgment and inspection. And the problem is you put one in, then you've put another, then you've put another, then you've put another. And inspection has become a tick list of hot topics rather than something that's actually a sort of a holistic assessment of how good is the service that this, this institution is providing. So, so we have um, our own Equality Act obligations, which we take very seriously. School, schools, have, schools have those obligations. We do look at equalities in the work that we do, but, but we do not have a role to, to monitor the diversity of school staffing. And that, 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 that would be, that's something quite different um, from the job that we do. And just one more. Um, do you think there could be uh, a replacement for GCSEs now that the participation age has increased to 18? We still have an education system where what young people study typically changes quite fundamentally um, at, at age 16. Everybody studies a broad curriculum up to 16. Um, many people don't, um, don't study maths or English um, or a foreign language um, after the age of 16. So it might be quite difficult to, to if, if you only certified at age 18, you'd then have, for many young people, a great deal of achievement um, that went unrecorded. So, we, we don't have the kind of education system that some countries have, which have, say, a 14 to 18 secondary phase where everything is examined at the end. We have this two part um, part of secondary education running to 16 and another part running to 18. So so I think you could only really conceive of that in the context of a, a more fundamental reform of post-secondary education. But as I said, it, it's. These are the kinds of ideas that it's always good to be exploring and testing. These these things should never should 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 never simply stand still and be assumed to be perfect and and inviolable. Excellent. And um, and just one final question from us. Um, it's it's normally a bit of a fun one that, that we end um, we, we end the Q and A's on. We we have already asked you which historical figure you would compare yourself to. So I'm not going to ask that again. But um, I'll go with. Um, which biscuit are you most excited to be offered on an inspection? <laughs> um, what would I be most like? A ginger nut. Ginger nut, excellent. That, that, the ginger nut tingle. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Chief Inspector, thank you so, so much for your time today. Um, for, for those at home, I hope you've enjoyed listening and, and please do enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much, John. It's been great to be here. Bye-bye.